Hi, this is Pat McDonald, your host for Vote for Vermont, where our tagline is listening beyond the sound bites. Um, ben Kinsley is here, as you can see, we are from our homes. And um, our guest tonight is Matthew Choate, who is the Chief Nursing Officer for Central Vermont Medical Center. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, uh, Pat and Ben, for having me tonight. Yeah, thank you. This is great because, as you, Matt was just trying to explain us, we've had Nurse Nurse Appreciation Day, we've had Nurse Appreciation Week, and we also had Health Appreciation. I think that's what you told me. So we want to thank our nurses tonight, and, um, and Matt, in his position, is the perfect person to talk to because all the nurses sort of report under your uh, bailiwick, correct? That's yeah. true, yes. And, and having been a patient up there more times than I care to admit, they are all wonderful. So we thank you very much. So could well, I, you think, tell um, I definitely think very highly of the staff there as well. So I, it's nice to hear that. Thank you. Well, no, that. we've been to the other two in the area and I just like being home because yeah. usually, I, usually I know one or two of them and that just helps. It makes you feel very comfy. So maybe you could tell our viewers a little bit about your background and who you are and how you came to this position. Uh, sure. I'll try and keep it brief. I grew up in Vermont. I'm a, a native of Caledonia County, so I lived in Barnet and the St. John, excuse me, St. Johnsbury and the surrounding area most of my life. I went to high school and graduated from the academy, and uh, following that, went to University of Vermont, where I received a bachelor's degree in biochemistry. And then I decided I didn't really want to be a biochemist after all. So a few years later, I got a second baccalaureate in nursing from UVM, and that was in 1997. So this actually marked my 23rd year as a nurse. Wow. Um, prior to going to nursing school, I did EMS work uh, in St. Johnsbury. So about another 10 or so more years before. So I've got about 30 plus years in healthcare at this point. Um, and my career's taken me here, there, and everywhere. I've worked in different hospitals in Vermont. I was a travel nurse for a while. Mm. Worked in some different hospitals around the country. My clinical background is all in critical care or emergency department settings, uh, adult and pediatric both. And when I decided to pursue a leadership career, I started in 2005 at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. I was there for a number of years in their peds ICU as the nurse manager. And then I worked on coincident with my uh, time in the legislature. I did my master's degree in business administration, which I finished in 2011. And, you, um, and I came into the current role that I'm in, I believe it was in early 17. So I think I just came past my third year anniversary in the role as chief nursing officer and vice president of patient care services. That means I have not only accountability for the nursing service across our organization, but I also have other departments, including pharmacy, um, that oh, I oversee, wow. oversee within the hospital as well. Interesting. And does that also wow. include um, the nursing home uh, on the yes. property there that you, uh, Woodridge, that's it. I, I went a little blank there. Woodridge is a beautiful facility. It most certainly is. We're very is, proud of the facility yeah, and we have a great staff there as well. Yeah, um, exactly. So I'm accountable for the nursing practice and nursing operation. There is an administrator at Woodridge who's responsible for the facility itself and the, mm -hmm. uh, the operations. And then I'm accountable for nursing practice throughout all of our physician office practices as well. And do you, I, I just remembering now all the places you got, do you do the um, emergency care on Route 302? That, that, is that under you too, the people that work there or the nurses um, that work there? Yeah, so that would be express care. Yes, they're yeah, part, of the, our, part of our group practice structure. So yeah. um, again, each, each of those places has sort of a manager of the place. Right. Um, I'm responsible for the nursing practice. Excellent. Yes. There, mm -hmm. there, it's another great place. I, I actually go there more now than I do at the emergency up at the hospital, which is the which is the point of the whole thing. So, um, <laughs> right. Well, well, we always want to make we always want to make sure you're getting the right care in the right place, right? And so, you know, the e ER is there if you need that. Um, yeah. But if we can get your care in some other less expensive or less uh, time consuming way, right. then right. that's definitely what we hope to do. That's good. Well, thank you yeah. for all that. My goodness. You're a, obviously a busy guy. Lots of uh, lots of things to keep track of, and um, you know, pretty pretty cool career path. It sounds like. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, I have a great team. So not only, you know, the, the nursing staff who works in the organization, but I have a great team of nurse leaders as well. So I certainly couldn't be responsible for many hundreds of people all by myself. So uh, I've got a good team of nurse leaders and uh, managers and directors both that, that report to me and um, collaborate with me and work with me to lead that team. Where is your Where is your office exactly? Right in um, CVMC? Um, yes, right I'm in the office. Office. I'm in the hospital. Actually, we're in the basement, which I call uh, we're cellar dwellers. We're down. Oh, very the nice. Well, near the <laughs> near the cafeteria. <laughs> right. <laughs> there's a there's a plus. Well, there, there. How many do you have all together? I didn't even ask that question. How many nurses people do you have reporting to you? Yeah, the number varies a little bit because of people full time, part time, per right. diem, but it's uh, it's somewhere around four hundred to four hundred and fifty oh, or so. Wow. Bless you. No sleeping for you. That's it. <laughs> anyway, Ben, you well, want to go ahead? Uh, shouldn't get too far into the show without uh, saying that my my mother is a nurse actually. Oh, great. She's been a nurse for. Um, over 30 years, uh, and most of which at uh, UVM, um, but a couple other hospitals as well. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's um, they're very dedicated people. Uh, you know, they do a lot of uh, a lot of hard work. Um, you know, and uh, they deserve a whole lot of credit, especially right now um, with what yeah, they're they going through. And we'll talk about that more here. Yeah. If you have a moment for a brief anecdote, I'll just share. I, nursing was not something that crossed my mind until I was in my 20s. Uh, as I said, I had started in the rescue service in the EMS arena and, um, and then went to nursing school later after I'd already been to college one time. I had originally thought I might end up being uh, a veterinarian or a physician or uh, or, or something like that. Um, primarily because I grew up on a farm, I thought, oh, veterinary medicine. And I can remember being a little kid and working with the vet and was very interested in that. And uh, I think what I experienced when I was doing EMS and working as a, as an almost like a nurse's assistant in the hospital setting, because I had a job there too, um, was that the folks who seemed to spend the most amount of time with people really got to know their story and really got to kind of untangle what was behind some of not only their medical conditions but what else might be going on for them in their in their world that made it difficult on their health um, were the nurses and that's what inspired me to actually go to school to be a nurse i hadn't considered it until that point so it was a second second kind of line of thinking of a career but nice. I have not regretted it once there's so much flexibility within the field of nursing I have done a lot of different things from bedside care to educating others to being on a transport team between hospitals to being a travel nurse, a leader, all, all sorts of different opportunities. So it's been a very flexible career and it was a great choice. That's great. Well, when you were appointed chief nursing officer, you listed three priorities that you committed yourself to. One was recognition for nurses. Mm -hmm. Second was fiscal management and third staff engagement. Um, you've put all those in place, I'm sure. And could you talk about the importance of those, of doing those things? Because I'm with you on the recognition part for sure. <laughs> Most definitely. Uh, yeah. Recognition is really important to me uh, as a leader. It's, it's paramount to everything we do. I think, you know, each of us finds value in the work that we do that's personal to us. And so it's hard for someone to necessarily come along and say, well, this is an important way to recognize you. Mm -hmm. It might not be quite as personal um, for each individual. And it's hard to come up with a way to recognize 400 people that's meaningful to all 400. And yet we try that on regular with regularity. Um, it's really about validating the work that we do as nurses. Mm -hmm. And often nurses don't seek out recognition and don't seek out accolades for the work we do and so i just feel it's really important to give that when we can it definitely helps with job satisfaction and with retention of staff if you're working in an environment where you feel cared for supported and recognized for the efforts that you do so that's huge and then engagement the second piece is about making sure i'm asking the people who are doing the work how best can we do that work because as i've learned in leadership as i go up you know from a from a clinical coordinator, which was right at the front line, to now the chief nursing officer, which is several rungs removed from the bedside. Mm -hmm. I'm not always the best person to answer the question 
what's best in this situation. It's the people who are doing the work. Right. And I feel like if you engage the staff at that level, con you know, consistently, that promotes good dialogue. We right. get to the get to the best solutions and we get to the best practices if we do that. And the third thing you mentioned was on fiscal responsibility. I, I did my master's in business, you notice, not in nursing, primarily because I wanted to be able to bridge the, the clinical to the business case. You know, hospitals are run by business people typically, although we're very fortunate at CVMC, our CEO uh, is actually a nurse herself. Um, so Ooh. she has that lens of nursing as well. Um, and it's great when you have both the nursing and the business um, background to really understand how the decisions that you're making impact not only clinical care, um, engagement and care of the staff, but also the business side of how a hospital runs. And as you know, in Vermont, it's, it's, a, it's an ever-changing landscape of how we finance healthcare. It's mm -hmm. very complicated and it's constantly moving and being able to understand and work in that fiscal environment was really important to me as a nurse leader. Good for you. That's great. That's a great point because we don't we don't think about you know hospitals being businesses all that often, um, but in, in you know in reality they are. Uh, you know even if they're a nonprofit, they're still a business, right? They're providing services and they have paid employees and they you know you have to operate <clears throat> this large infrastructure. You know if you look yeah, at um, the largest employers in Vermont. Um, is the state first of all, but second of all is the is the UVM Medical Center and its subsidiaries is the um, largest private employer in the state, um, and you know that takes managers to run that. It's not you know it doesn't just run itself. You have to have you know business managers that run that network, um, like like you and your um, your colleagues. Right. Yeah, it's, it's actually, uh, I think the mantra in healthcare has always been, if you're a great clinician, you sort of prove yourself as a clinical star, that's how you move into a leader position. Well, mm -hmm. who should manage us but the best clinician? And I can tell you from experience, the best clinician is not always the best manager slash leader, um, not only in nursing, but for physicians as well. We've had to learn, and I think you've seen this change over the last 10 or 20 years, um, physicians and nursing both, as well as our allied health folk, have learned that business acumen is really helpful and it's important to have, whether you had it to begin with in school, which most of us did not, or whether you pursued that outside of, uh, of your clinical tra training, such as I did by, by doing the MBA program. I wish businesses um, understood, you just mentioned it before, about just because you're a great clinician doesn't mean you're a good manager. And in business, they're always promoting the best scientist or the best this. Mm -hmm. And it usually turns out to be completely disastrous because he's, <laughs> right. he or she is the best scientist for a reason and nothing to do with management and, right. and um, or their owed because they've been here 20, 30 years. No, that's not the way to do it. Yes. So good for yes. you. Good for you. I've really seen that actually play out. I mean, I can imagine it plays out significantly in healthcare. I've seen it play out in software development as well, where you have um, the best software developers are very rarely the best managers. It's a totally different skill set. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, Pat, I think you're on mute. Again, we're going to do this. You have to teach me how to do this. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, Matt, I knew, I knew Judy Tataglia very well. I also knew, um, oh my gosh. Who was before Judy? Um, can't uh, was Daria. it Daria? Daria, Daria Mason. Yeah, she, lived, yes. she lived here right in the, in the Berlin, so I knew her and Judy. And Judy wrote something um, in one of the letters in, in the, um, on your website that she was very impressed with um, all of your skills and your business mind and recognized the importance of data in your in your job, that you're a data guy and that you look at the data to help make the right decisions. And you also um, continued the development, which I'd like you to talk about, about the Shared Nursing Accountability Councils, which really perked my interest. Accountability is a good word to use. Accountability is a good word to use, although I've changed the word now to governance, and I'll tell you ah. why. Um, so my experience through the leadership career that I've had has, has been in a model of shared governance. And what shared governance is, is really shared decision making and shared leadership. And in this case, as it applies to the field of nursing. So 
when we think about shared governance structure within organizations, we're thinking about how do staff and leadership have the right structure and tools around them to, to do shared decision making so that it's not Matt Choate deciding everything we're going to do and then everybody just go do it. Um, as I said earlier, it's I'm not always the best person to ask which way we should do X, Y, or Z, right? It's really about what does the evidence show? What does the data show? What does our own experience show? And what's the voice of the staff nurse in that? And so, so when I came to CBMC, they had um, actually had a couple of consultants working here and they, the, the hospital did not have a shared governance or shared accountability structure. So they had just put that in place. Um, and I took that structure and continued it for about a year or a year and a half or so. And then we, we elected as a group to move that into shared governance. The important distinction being that accountability suggests people have, have ownership of a particular piece. Mm -hmm. um, governance suggests to me that we are really leading our own and making our own destiny. It's a slightly different definition for me. Um, and so our governance structure as it stands right now, we, we've broken our work into various councils. Those councils are made up mostly of staff nurses. We do have leadership at each council as well. Um, and we break those down into areas of jurisdiction, if you will. So we have a practice council that looks at nursing practice. We have a quality council that looks at all of our data and outcomes. Um, safety issues, things like that. We have an informatics council that looks at like technology and how we use that. Um, we have a management and operations council, which deals with staffing, scheduling, pay practices, all the things you would think about being traditional manager roles. And then we have a oh, professional development, which looks at our edu educational needs, certification, recognition, all those pieces. And you can see, it's hard to imagine, there's a lot of work that goes on, which is why we've broken this down into those councils. And we actually just stood up in the last few months a new LNA council to recognize that nursing can't do all of its work unless our LNA partners, that's licensed nursing assistants, right. are with us. And so we gave them a council. We have provided a council and they are participating in a council that's on equal playing field to the rest of the nursing councils. And so that's where they can have some control and governance over their practice as well, which has been awesome to see. Um, and then ultimately there's a coordinating council at the top that all of those roll up into where uh, decisions that are made at each council are vetted, just reported out through the coordinating council. And typically we just do final adoption of things there. And then it's my job and my director's job to implement those things, Great. not to, not to then say, no, we veto that, or we don't like that because we've been part of the discussion and part of the process right along. And so the goal is you're working together with the staff to lead your practice. That's great. And That's it's, the best way to do it. Yeah, it's really powerful. It's powerful. Like and we're trying actually now to think about how could we extend that whole hospital um, and even into the network, which of course, you know, we're just beginning the, the baby steps in that direction okay. because that's a much larger scale um, and a very different structure potentially between different hospitals to try and navigate. So. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> so you you but it, talked about um, like your most recent council is the LNA council, which is really a growing piece of um, healthcare delivery is the mm -hmm. utilization of LNAs. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how that's transforming nursing, but also healthcare as well? Uh, can you clarify that a little bit more? I'm not sure so, I understand. So what, in what ways are the use of LNAs or, the, you know, the fact that they're becoming more prevalent, how's that changing oh, okay. healthcare delivery? Okay. Uh, I guess I would respond by saying, I'm not sure it's changing the delivery so much as what's really important to me and to the team I work with is that everyone practice at top of license. And as we can really partner with our licensed nursing assistants to make sure that they can really practice to the top of their skill set and top of their license and not be restricted in some way. That gives us much more flexibility around what the nurses can then be freed up to do to make sure they have that time to spend with family right. and care planning and do those other things that we look at for nursing quality. So, um, yeah, the LNA is an integral role. We want to see, it see that role practice to the top of their skill set. And, you know, it's been a challenge. I don't know if we're, we may segue here a little bit into workforce development, but actually finding 
um, qualified LNAs has been very challenging in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And we've actually started a num started an LNA program of our own um, to work on workforce development with that role. And that extends to nursing as well, which I think, well, that was one of your questions maybe later. Yeah. We'll, we'll yeah. get to that. But um, it's really important for us to be able to, to hire and train and get in place um, those LNA positions that really make our nursing service work well. That's great. I've, I've worked with, uh, when I've gone to see my doctors, I've got a few physicians and they always, they have the LNAs there and they're, they're just wonderful to work with. They're, uh, for some reason, they're, um, well, maybe a little less clinical. They just know how to approach you in a, um, in a nice way that you're able to spill your guts. I mean, they're, they're really great. That's good. But can I, I wanted to change the topic just a little bit because um, I mentioned in, in the questions that uh, Ben and I did an eight part series on uh, opioid addiction here in Vermont. And we also have done quite a few um, uh, programs on mental health. I'm, uh, we work with Central Vermont Mental Health, uh, Washington County Mental Health quite a bit. And they're, using, they're on our program. How do you, and I know, as particularly mental health, I know that um, when people come into the AR and there's all kinds of issues that uh, that your folks have to be trained to deal with. And I can't imagine the impact of both opi opioid and um, the mental health issues here, the impact they've got on your nurses and how you keep them trained to deal with this stuff. Yeah, I can, uh, we could do two whole shows on oh, either sure. of those topics. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm sure. uh, I will say this, we are, we are all across nursing um, impacted by both of those situations. I will say that the nurses in the emergency department are probably on the front line of that uh, in both circumstances. So uh, with respect to the mental health um, situation, it's been very interesting during this COVID epidemic that we've seen our numbers of uh, patient seeking help for mental health the decrease pretty significantly. That's and we're actually we're actually trying to figure out like why that is. Um, our working hypothesis is that the designated agencies, at least in Washington County, have been doing a lot more outreach and a lot more mm -hmm. checking in with their folks. And we're wondering if that added level of support, which is out there relative to COVID, is actually providing better care in a way, right? Because you're you're limiting those number of ER visits and you're helping avoid crises that happen in mental health. Because as you know, the, the thing we always talk about, we've been talking about it 20 years now, is this kind of growing problem of patients seeking help. Um, when they're in crisis, they end up in the emergency department and then there's no place for them to go right. for definitive care. And so we're housing, you know, on any day, you know, lots of people in our emergency department. That's true of every hospital in the state. Um, the last eight weeks or so, we've housed almost nobody or they've been for very short periods of time. Hmm. So, so the usage has gone down significantly and we've, we're, we're, we don't understand entirely why. Is it just people avoiding looking for care right now? They're scared, they're worried about coming to the hospital or are some of those extra layers of support that have been put in place for COVID actually making a positive benefit? So that's work we're just analyzing and gonna do some more work on now, but it's very interesting. Um, that's very interesting. I'm, yeah. I'd be curious to know like what what is driving that. Right, yes. I don't, know, yeah. I don't know who it was, but there was uh, just, on this afternoon, somebody saying, don't be afraid to go to the hospitals because mm -hmm. of COVID. If you're sick, go to the hospitals. It's safe. Um, you know, get the treatment you need because it sounded like people were not wanting to go to the hospital um, because I don't know why, because I don't think we've had many cases. Have you um, at the hospital? No, I think we've had uh, eight. Yeah, total. that's... Um, which is which is not very many and certainly yeah. well below what was predicted, but that has a lot to do with the early application of social distancing and all the yeah. kind of extreme measures that were taken to prevent that. What's what's interesting, and you you just said it, Pat. We've we've heard feedback from our patient family advisors and some folks in the community that the message they were hearing was really around don't come to the hospital unless right. it's absolutely necessary. Right. And that's actually not the message we were trying to convey. But when you read through, you know, the daily occurrences that were happening, you know, surgeries are being canceled. We're trying to make sure, you know, we have capacity in the hospital. I right. think 
people who were a little unsure, should I seek care right now or not, were waiting for care. Because yeah. what we've seen in the last few weeks is more a higher acuity illness that has been coming. The patient's coming with higher illness because they've delayed seeking care. But right. our message is really, we are open, we have capacity, we want to make sure that you feel safe in coming and we're, we're starting to try to get back to some kind of normalcy, even though we're going to maintain social distancing, masking, and some of those other protective things for the time. Yeah. The very foreseeable very future anyway. Uh, and then you mentioned the opioids. I didn't answer that part, yeah. but that's, um, I think the biggest impact on us, you know, certainly in the emergency department, we see those emergency crisis situations that occur with overdose. Um, but we also feel it in other ways. We've got a large population of folks who have chronic pain issues that we're trying to manage um, in this now post-opioid world. How are we going to manage those those symptoms and give good treatment and give good support when opioids aren't the best answer necessarily? Right. Um, you know, they have a place. They have medicinal use, and we want to continue to use them as appropriate. But we know that they were far overused, overutilized, um, and overprescribed. And so, um, you know, the system changed pretty quickly, and I think the patients are still trying to catch up to the changes that have happened. So Good. that's more the impact we see, um, I would say. And we've got a lot of support and resources out there to help with it, managing this. Well, that's One good to hear that, because. I'm sorry, but some of the people we had on the show were not very encouraging back well, that was what, about a year ago, I think. Yeah, it is still a huge problem. I don't want to diminish that. Um, but I do feel like some I've seen some positive gains in what we're doing with more chronic pain management. And I've seen some positive gains in decreasing the prescription of opioids where where it sometimes bends and this this actually is something we haven't seen to the same extent as Kentucky but I have a nursing colleague in Kentucky who said oh our our legislature changed you know how you prescribe opioids and same kind of things that everybody's looking at doing right now and what actually happened was they saw more heroin or more illegal opioid use right. immediately afterwards because now the legal supply of opioids went away right. and Pay, you know, people still found alternates and actually made things much worse for a couple of years. And so we haven't seen, I haven't experienced, at least in Washington County, that same delta that they saw in, in Kentucky, certainly, but we have seen some of that. So it's still a huge problem. Um, and it's a multifactorial problem, but I do see some glimmers of hope that maybe we're getting the right things in the right Good. place to help with that. And like Is I said, we, we could spend three hours talking about opioids, but oh, yeah. um, oh, there's yeah. a lot on that. Easily. Ben, do you remember the show we had? Um, one of the doctors from UV, uh, from um, uh, UVM was saying that they they're treating the whole person now, mm. and which yeah. means like if um, massages. That raised my hand on that one. If yeah. massages work for you, if X is, I mean, they're trying to find things that will involve you in your own treatment. What what things your body needs, not just the sore throat or whatever you're dealing with. I thought that was great because wellness is a huge issue in all. In, I know in, in the hospital and also in um, uh, companies where they try to prevent rather than um, react after you're sick. I thought that was great. It's really wonderful to see. Because, um, nurse, nursing by default is a holistic practice, right? We, ah, we, yes. we, really, we really assess the whole patient and try to address, as I said way at the beginning, right. you know, the person who spends the most time with you typically in a hospital stay is the nurse. Um, and they get to know you, know your family, know your support structure, know you, right. the person, know about your diet, maybe know about your med. Yeah, they get into more depth a lot of times than your physician does mm -hmm. in episodic care, just by the nature of how we do our work. And so, nursing is always a holistic practice, and I think nurses have a great deal to contribute to solving a problem like opioids right. for sure. That's great. Great. Well, I think you know one of the things I've heard. We've heard this from Washington County Mental Health, <clears throat> and they've started embedding some of their staffers with um, first responders when they get a call about something that sounds like it could be a mental health issue. But what's interesting is it can sometimes be difficult to distinguish between someone that's having a mental health episode and someone who is um, uh, having uh, an opiate crisis. Um, like sometimes those behaviors are similar. Do you ever see that happen in, you know, like the emergency room or when patients get admitted to uh, the hospital? Uh, very definitely, yes. Um, and often it's not one or the other. Often they come together. So, you know, it's very, very common 
um, that someone with an opioid related issue may or may have a co um, comorbidity that is a mental health issue. Um, it's not always, and they're not mutually exclusive either, but there, it, it is frequently those things are seen together. So yeah, that's, mm-hmm. that's, that's not uncommon, I would say. Well, that's got to be difficult to, to triage and then figure out a, a treatment plan for as well, because even if a physician is coming up with the treatment plan, I, I would imagine nurses oftentimes are helping to implement that um, or dealing with the patient while they're in crisis. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. And, it, and it's so individualized and so personal too. It, so many variables with each patient that it's really takes some good assessment and good listening and good care planning to really come up with the best strategy for each one. That's exactly the, that's exactly the role a registered nurse would fill for sure. That's great. Um, I read an article that said, let me get my numbers here. They had a survey. They said, well, that Vermont, of course, it is 2020, will need 3,900 new nurses by 2020 due to attrition and retirement. And there's all kinds of things that hospitals are trying to do. Everybody's giving sign-on bonuses. Um, there's a couple of places where I saw ads, $5,000 for a sign-on bonus and, um, and have paid for schooling. And um, I, I don't know what the answer is because when you look at your website, you have an A to Z listing of all the departments you have where nurses can go. And there's like, a, 109, I counted them, 109 different places where nurses could go and practice um, um, what they've learned. I mean, it's amazing. Why why aren't they interested? There's some really unique things and some basic things that we think about nursing, but there's some, you know, really off the wall kind of things that would be fun to be involved in. You know, there's such a selection. It's like incredible. I like to think I've done all 109, but I don't think I've done that many. <laughs> I counted it. It said 109. <laughs> um, I can tell you, uh, well, I'll tell you a few general things. You you will both know that we have a demographic shift in, underway in Vermont. We are a population that is not necessarily growing. It is growing older. Um, mm-hmm. So our workforce is, sh- is shrinking a bit. Um, I looked at, I I like to read things on the Joint Fiscal Office website, um, which I became familiar with when I was in the legislature years ago. And I've followed it ever since because that's where you really get the idea of what's going on, right? Follow the money money and you'll see where where our priorities are. And um, what was really scary was there was a report, I think it's up there still from about a year ago about kind of where our population trends are going. Mm. And that, mm-hmm. that in, a, in another 10 years, um, we have a significant number of people retiring um, out of the workforce, and that creates a big number of jobs behind it. Unfortunately, the population curve is not growing at the same rate. So it makes me wonder in five or 10 years, am I going to even have a labor force to hire yeah. into? Right. So we're trying to put things in place now that help us address that. Um, you know, certainly we can do sign-on bonuses and things like that for people who are already nurses. Um, but again, unless they're moving to Vermont, um, you know, all the hospitals kind of fish from the same pond, so to speak. So we're really competing with each other. Yeah. Um, and that's really challenging when you have a small labor force to pull from. Yeah, I was um, on the I was on the board of uh, Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice. And they were they were having the same trouble. Uh, Mary Moulton has it in Washington yeah. County. People are going from one one place, you know, job jumping, one place to the other. Absolutely, we experience it all the time. Um, we are uh, we have recognized. I think I'm a big proponent that there's more than one way to skin a cat, and so there's more than one way to become educated as a nurse. Um, some years ago. The, the goal was to get everybody to be a bachelor of science in nursing, mm-hmm. registered nurse, four-year degree. I'm not opposed to that at all. I think it's the right direction to go. But I'm also practical in that not every person can come out of high school or even a couple of years out of high school and go to four-year university. It's just not practical for a lot of people. It's expensive. If mm-hmm. you have a family, if you're trying to support yourself, going to school is is not that path is for some people, it's not for everybody. So what can we do to capture more of the non-traditional university path oriented folks? And so we've started that partnership with VTC and CCV around um, helping LNAs, LNAs who already work for us, who, meant, who some of whom want to become nurses, but just have no way to get there. They can't mm-hmm. give up their job to go to school full time, or they can't 
leave their family to go to school full time. So how can we bridge them over? And we started an LNA to LPN program. LPNs is licensed practical nurse. That's a program that VTC still has. LPNs used to be used in the 70s and 80s mm. quite a lot. Um, they shrunk in numbers in the hospital as we kind of pushed everybody to that BSN RN level. Again, not opposed to the going in that direction, but I think there's a role for LPNs. And so we're kind of resurrecting it a little bit in how do we help our LNAs get to that LPN? That's the first step in getting to a registered nurse, if that's the career path they want to get to and they're capable of getting there. So that program's underway. We actually have a cohort of 17 um, who are participating, who are were LNAs that work for us, um, many of them at Woodridge, some of them from the mm -hmm. hospital, a couple from the practices who um, have been taking a year of prerequisite classes around their work schedule that we've received grant funding and um, we use some of our tuition reimbursement and so forth to help pay for. So it was no, no cost to the student to get their prerequisites all done. And we had the classes on campus at the hospital. Mm -hmm. So that eliminated some of the transportation issues and some other things for folks. Um, starting in August, they'll be in an 11 month program through VTC to become LPNs. And actually we are supplying the faculty. So this is a oh, great partnership. Perfect. I have a number of nurses who have master's degrees that are looking for opportunities to teach. I'm like, great, here's an opportunity yeah. So we have some folks that signed up to help as faculty. Um, we're going through a process right now to select faculty for this program. Um, and we will reduce all of these are full-time folks who are going to drop to part-time. And we will supplement their wage, keep them as a full-time paid employee while Perfect. they go to school. So that's, that's just one way of getting at, like, how can I grow some nurses within mm -hmm our own organization. And then we created the LNA program behind it to kind of backfill in those positions as we fill them. The next step is really looking at how do I help you get from your LPN to RN? Um, so we're working on that right now to see if we can partner with um, with either VTC or other schools have expressed some interest mm -hmm. in that as well. So we're gonna take a look at that. And, um, and the finally, we're looking at how you get from RN to BSN. That can be an online, that can be done online. So once you have a two-year RN degree, how do I get you to your bachelor's degree? Oh, I see. Right? So, right. and that way we have an alternate for someone who say comes out of high school, wants to start a family or wants to start earning an income, could come in as an LNA and work their way in basically one more year than they would have spent had they gone to a four-year university, but could come out of that relatively debt-free and that's and um, and earn money, earn a living the whole time they went to awesome. school. So awesome. I just think those are the kind of partnerships, um, not only healthcare, but any, really any employer in Vermont needs to be thinking about. Yeah. Because those are those are hopefully geared at how do I keep young people in Vermont here in Vermont instead of mm -hmm. having everybody leave, which is the trend that we know is happening. Well, that's we think really uh, Ben. Cool. Will, sorry, go ahead, Ben. Uh, I was going to say, that's, just, that's really cool because you're creating your own workforce development pipeline, right? right. You can get mm -hmm. people in at a ground level, see if they're interested in the field. You know, there's not a, a huge investment to get to that LNA level and then just work your way up from there, um, you know, while you're working and being able to gain that educational experience as well as work experience. Um, it's, it's really cool. Exactly. Um, I, have, did I, you have, get I have to say, the organizations we've partnered with on this have been phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And it really, I really, if, if there's others listening who own businesses or, or are employed in a field that's looking for help, these were the ways to do it. Uh, the schools yeah. have been very engaged. Um, certainly the Department of Labor and Department of Economic Development that we've worked with at the state have been great in helping pair these things. CCV has been wonderful to work with. Um, and then our own internal team, obviously through our HR, um, colleagues and others in the organization have been really good about pulling all this together. It's a lot of work, um, but it's the right work to do if we're going to grow that workforce. For yes. Well, Ben and I have been, this program has been very supportive of uh, technical education because people can't afford the, the four-year degrees. You go to BTC for two years, you probably have half the financial obligation, and you go out and you make a great living, uh, good salary jobs and uh, we just we support it every chance we get. And now this latest thing that they're going through is concerning us. And we've been we've been writing um, things to encourage the legislature to support them as much as, as they can. It's, it's the answer that our businesses like you and, and other businesses need. You need people to kind of do the work, not necessarily the four year 
um, degrees. We, yeah, exactly. we, I love VTC. And we'd love to get you all to a four-year degree. That's that's oh, for the yeah. end goal, but yeah. it, not everybody can just drop everything and go to right. you know right. UVM or UNH or wherever you're going right. to go to a four-year school and and pay that hundred plus thousand dollars right. that it's going to cost right. to go there. And then you live with a debt for years. So I can't imagine during this COVID crisis, people that have debts to pay, and it's pretty tragic. If that like um, takes you forever. It does. Uh, I can I can attest for that because my, that right? I'm, not, I'm not quite 50 almost. And I I wanted to make it a goal to get rid of all my student debt um, by oh the age of 50. And I'm, and I'm I'm COVID kind of sent me back a little bit, but I'm still going to try and make it to the end. <laughs> Good for you. Well, I can't imagine. I looked at they had your name written somewhere and you had about six or seven. I wrote it down somewhere about six or seven initials. I mean, a little clumps of initials, mm -hmm. some of which I had to look up because I didn't even know what they were. So there you go. <laughs> so could we talk a little bit about COVID? Um, tell yeah, us, I, I mean, like I mean you got hit with this, uh, uh, with the COVID virus, and you guys have just turned your hospital inside out to try to keep everybody safe, the patients and the doctors are just opening up day surgeries I, or, and procedures, because that's why I got a call, but um, not overnight surgeries. Is that uh, what's happening now? We do have capability to do overnight ones, oh. yes. Um, they have to be time sensitive, uh, which means that there are more urgency to them. It's not right. an emergency, but more urgent than you know something that could wait. Yeah. Um, so we are looking if there's particular patients that have time sensitive issues. The main reason for that is we didn't, um, the governor's order specifically calls that out um, as a way to prevent hospitals from being overwhelmed with volume if suddenly we should have a surge in coronavirus cases. So, right. uh, you know, um, you know, for us at CBMC, most of our surgery is ambulatory surgery, meaning that it's outpatient. Oh, um, no. we, we do have a small number of patients that are admitted into the hospital. Total joints typically are uh -huh. admitted. And sometimes you have general surgery, abdominal surgery or whatnot that you need to be uh, have a stay in the hospital. Uh -huh. But 90% uh -huh. of what we do for surgery is outpatient surgery. How did you um, handle the nursing homes? Because uh, you have Woodridge and the stories about some of these nursing homes are just scary where this, this thing has just gone right through. So what's interesting about this COVID thing, I, I wrote down here just some notes when I was thinking about this question was, as I think one thing you were, might look at is lessons learned, but yeah. we, we do emergency preparedness discussions. We do tabletop exercises where we all stage like this is happening in the community and what, what would our response be? And those exercises are great to a point, but this was one that actually happened and it, ha it happened with some rapidity. So uh, I'll just share, I was on vacation when this all started. I flew right. back from, from vacation the day uh, on Sunday, came to work on Monday and they're like, oh, we're in the middle of a growing pandemic if you've been watching the news, which right. I had been. And of course I wondered if I was even gonna get home, let alone right. come into work. And, and uh, we have to prepare for X number of patients who might show up at any given moment. And so, there were so many moving parts of this. There was, you know, what are the right precautions to take for this illness? It's a new illness. So you had to learn what does this illness do? How does it behave? You know, what kinds of personal protective equipment, PPE do you need? How should we treat? Is there a test? All these things kind of happened in the first couple of weeks of this. And to your point, we turned the hospital upside down because we really went to the maximum level of protection for both staff and patients that we could. So there is uh, something called a negative pressure room, which basically keeps the air inside the room, um, inside the room and venting and doesn't mm -hmm. contaminate the rest of your facility. And on a normal day, we have four of those in the hospital. They're permanently installed. And because some cases like shingles, measles, chicken pox, they're airborne illnesses. And so you have to have a room that's capable of of no. the air properly. No. Well, we stood up temporary negative pressure rooms because that was the maximum level of protection that was suggested early on in the COVID response. No. And so we, we made 19 total spaces instead of four. So that's an example of having wow. to like really quickly figure out how are we going to turn basic rooms into negative mm -hmm. pressure rooms. And what's our protocol? How are patients going to go in there? How are staff going to go in there? And it was always with an eye about 
keeping our staff safe and keeping other patients safe. For sure. Um, so there was a lot, endless, endless numbers of hours of planning meetings. You know, every people got a little frustrated and burned out over the six weeks because guidance changed every day. Sometimes two or three times a day. Like literally, I can remember taking like, here's what we did at eight o'clock. I'm going to write this all up. I'm going to get it out to the staff. It's out by eleven o'clock, and at noon it changed again. Wow. And you know, every day for weeks on end, it was maddening. I'll Is that because we were learning different things about the disease, or exactly because now this thing with the little kids, with the children, are getting some kind of um, something yep. different. But oh, like, and we're still, right, we're still learning, right? We're still yeah, right. Learning information all the time. It's been good the last few weeks because it has settled down a little bit. We've got a handle on now we've seen enough patients who, who both had COVID and did not that our physicians are recognizing the symptoms a little bit more cleanly. We have testing. Mm -hmm, so testing right. was a big problem early on because you could get the testing done, but the result would not come back for 24, 36, 48, oh. 72 hours at one point. And so you had to keep that patient isolated until you had the test result back. Mm -hmm. And then even then the test result isn't 100% accurate. So it was really driven by not only the test result, but how the patient looked as well and how they were responding. So there was a lot of that just around <laughs> confusion around PPE, around testing, around protocol. Now that we've, we've seen the numbers come down and we've had a chance to kind of take a breath and look at that, we've, we've cleaned up a lot of those things and the guidance has gotten a little more clear as we've learned more about the disease. Mm -hmm. So that we expect another bump in this, right? We're gonna, it's gonna be in the community, yeah. right? So we will, we will be better prepared now because we know what we're looking for. Number right. one, um, the thing that's still, you know, a little bit, uh, I would say, fragile is the are the two fronts of testing. So still making sure we have adequate testing supplies. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not that we don't have a test, but it's getting the reagents and getting the supplies you yeah. need perform the test and a reliable supply of PPE because masks, gown, gloves, you know, many of those things are actually made in China and China shut down for a month. And so there went your supply chain. So it, I hope one thing that will come out of this as a country is we will, we will figure out a way to distribute our supply chain a little more evenly mm -hmm. so that oh, you're not just stuck to one source for things, which is what's happened. Mm -hmm. I'm or, sure there's a large national back. stockpile, one of the two. Yeah, yes. they yes. didn't. They were, didn't have one going, did they? I think they're going to have to sit down and and redo. I mean, just rethink everything you've done and document it. And there you go, because we have to be ready if it ever happens. They say in the fall it's going to be bad again. That's that's the prediction. Yes, yeah. right. Well, if it behaves like other, you know, coronaviruses, which were right. there's several of them, um, if it behaves like those, there is a seasonality to them. Um, and we'll see as the, as the country opens up and people start moving around again, you know, just how many more exposures there will be and right. and come in. But you know, we're we're we've learned a lot, and we'll definitely apply that knowledge going forward. So one I, of the um, I was I just wanted to say I'm sorry I'm very uh, vocal here today, but um, right. you asked about the, nurse, the nursing home. Woodridge did a superb job. I have I have experienced working with other nursing homes, we put in negative pressure rooms at Woodridge, which is something oh, that's wow. largely unheard of in nursing homes, especially if you look at other states, nobody did this. Hmm. We did it so that if anybody inside Woodridge became sick, we could isolate them for the worst case scenario while they were tested and treated. And, and we had zero cases thus far, knock on wood, of COVID-19 at Woodridge. Um, so they did a phenomenal job. We went into early lockdown, if you will, you know, kind of preventing visitors from coming, which is hard on families, hard on the people who live there but also protected those people there. The residents were protected from as few outside exposures as possible. And I'm really proud of that team down there for yeah. making sure that we took good care of the residents and got through this first wave, at least with relatively unscathed. Well, one of the, one of the, you know, the whole point of social distancing in Vermont seemed to be a week, if not a week and a half ahead of most of the other States around the country. Um, you know, we're pretty, pretty proactive in um, shutting things down, social distancing, um, appropriate, uh, you know, protective measures out in the community to try to reduce community transmission. And the whole point of that, in my understanding, is to try to, you know, 
avoid the uh, surge um, hitting hospitals, right, where you start having to ration care. Um, how how many people in your community do you think you can, you know, you said you have 19, you have 19 negative pressure rooms. How many, you know, people can you actually handle um, testing positive in central Vermont? Well, one thing we learned from this is not everybody has to be in negative pressure room. So we did that right at the beginning because no one knew, including CDC, how to take care of this illness. And so the guidance was, if you want to go to the maximum level of safety, here's what you do. Um, now that we've learned more about the disease and know that um, it's actually safe to manage patients who are presenting with those symptoms uh, in droplet precaution rooms, which just basically means the staff caring for those patients need to wear a, a fit mask, an N95 mask it's called, or a self-contained breathing a hood, one or the other, um, gowns and gloves, and a face protection. That's the level you need. And you don't, whether you have the negative pressure or not is irrelevant. The only time it becomes really important is if you do something that generates aerosol, such as a nebulizer treatment or um, placing a breathing tube, or there's a few other circumstances. In those cases, you have to be in the negative pressure environment because it protects the rest of the place from that aerosol being disseminated. Um, so because of that, that greatly expands the number of patients you could take care of. At our maximum of our surge plan, we had we had identified locations and most of the staffing needed to take care of about 100 patients. Um, so that's the number that we settled on. But that would be literally using every nook, cranny, and staff member we had. Um, and we, we did not see anywhere near that number of patients, but uh, that's that's what we would have capacity for, I would say. But we'll knock on wood on that one because um, that's good that we had low numbers because that's that's the first place I look when they're leaving when they're listing numbers I look for Washington County and we're using <laughs> one of the lowest. Absolutely. Is, yeah. Now, if if fifty patients showed up all at once, that would be a little bit of a mass casualty for right. us. That would, you know, if they came over a period of a few days, we'd manage it a little bit yeah. differently than if they yes. showed up in three hours, but. <laughs> yeah, um, obviously that, that's that was the fear yeah. was like a whole bunch of people would just come all at once and overwhelm your hospital, right? So we don't even have any chairs for them in the lobby. <laughs> right. <laughs> Standing room only now. Pat. Standing room only. <laughs> so what I, so it's interesting. So it looks like um on average anyway in the US about five percent of people that contract it need to be hospitalized. Is that about right? That sounds right, yes. So, um, so of those, so that would mean that if you had, you're at hundred percent capacity, maybe you had a hundred people in the, um, in the hospital, that's probably about 2000 people in central Vermont, right? That's a pretty large number, obviously much bigger than what we had in this first wave. Yes. Much bigger. Let's see. That sounds like the correct math. Mm-hmm. So you back been, of the envelope math anyway. <laughs> you mentioned the next wave, and you've been mentioning the next wave. Are we pretty sure there's going to be a next wave, or we're, that's just the way these type of viruses go? Uh, what I'm pretty sure of from my own experience is that it, it will be in our community for quite some time, at least until there's some immunity developed to it, if that's possible. Right. Again, yeah. we're studying still whether, whether – single acute episode of illness causes immunity or not. So we don't yeah. have the answer really on that yet. Um, but if it behaves like other viruses and other flus and other cold viruses, it will have a repetitive, it will kind of always be there and yeah. it will have some seasonal spikes. Influenza spikes up usually in October, November, and often we see another little spike in March or April. So if this behaves in the same way, yeah, we'd expect to see that. The question nobody knows, I think, is just how many people will have it. Oops, to that point, is it if it's five percent that gets symptomatic, you know, how many people have to have that for you to see an appreciably large number in the hospital? And how many will have that mild case, the medium case, the severe right. case? That that remains very unknown. So I think until we, we get there and kind of see what's happening, it's hard to predict whether there'll be a point in time that has a spike or not. Well, we're almost at the end of the show, and I want to end on an upbeat note. This discussion is, um, oh, I must say that it sounds like that disease at the end is a pretty horrible experience. Yeah. The lungs and, and breathing and, um, yeah. So let us talk about the Rose Black Nursing Excellence Award, 
okay. Um, uh, because I saw your picture in the paper. But, um, that wasn't that long ago, right? Um, uh, so we usually do this award during Nurses Week. Um, oh, with, oh, there you go. with Well, with COVID, interestingly enough, we postponed our a lot of the um, things we typically do with Nurses Week because they yeah. are gatherings. Um, and we're going to try and do it in the early fall. So we just pushed it aside from them. But you asked who... So Rose Black is uh, as a family member. We have Dr. Deborah Black, who's one of our neurologists, and it's it, she is a um, family member of Rose. Rose was was a patient at our hospital at one point in time, and she has a really fascinating story, which I read every Rose Black Award. So I tried to recall from my memory just a few key things about Rose Black. But she um, em emigrated from Romania actually during World War One. And her and she was 13, I think, at the time, and her, her future yeah. husband to be was 14. And he took her and the two of them fled Romania under gunfire, um, basically to escape the war. And they ended up coming to the U.S. They raised a family here and she did a number of things throughout her life. But she worked with a, co a convent in upstate New York which is how she got up into this area. And she helped get teenage girls on the right path. This is back in the 50s and 60s, which I thought was, was awesome. She was a patient at CVMC uh, sometime, I believe it was in the 90s. And she wanted to create this award because she had such exceptional nursing care. And she established the award and we do it every nurse's a week and we've actually expanded it with her family support and guidance over time so that now we present the rose black award for excellence to a nurse who works at the hospital a nurse that works at woodridge and a nurse that works in the practices and we also created an lna award for hospital woodridge and practice so we give away a total of six of those hmm. each nurse's week and we'll be doing it again this year as we get um, into september hopefully provided we haven't seen a mass run on coronavirus again we'll see yeah, well my my husband goes to see dr black so we'll have to find out more in person she can that's totally cool. fill you in on the down the rest oh, wow. of the <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's very cool though like just um you know it's it's good to be able to recognize um exceptional providers right um this is an incredibly tough job um and there's obviously a lot of technical skills involved in it but also a lot of you know personal you know um skills involved uh with it and um it's it's cool to be able to recognize um uh, you know those workers for what they're doing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah we also have um so the rose black is is peer nominated and anyone can submit a nomination co-worker colleague uh friend family physician we get nominations of all different kinds um we also so that's once a year we also have the daisy award which is a an ongoing recognition program for nursing and that's done every other month and those nominations come from patients from families um, and also can come from coworkers as well. But there's a blinded process and it's uh, a peer group of staff nurses that actually select the winner without knowing who the winner is based on the story that was submitted and the, the kind of elements of the things they're scoring for. But um, that's been really successful. We've had it, uh, let's see, between two and three years now. And um, and we've given away, I think 15 or 16 Daisy Awards in that time. So that's, that's also a way patients and families can recognize a uh, great care they had by a nurse. Very cool. You yeah. put on your website two, two statements, and we're going to end the program with this. It says, where nursing matters, and mm -hmm. it says, invested in the success of its nurses, because I'm sure without their hard work and the work that they do, if they're not successful, it just sort of doesn't reflect very well, but you've got a great staff for sure, and we thank them very much for everything they do for for us as patients and the community. Thank so, you. Yeah, very nice. We're so thrilled you're on the show. Thanks um, so much. Yes, and please keep in touch if there's anything else that we need to know about what's happening to our lovely hospital. Well, you've always been unsung heroes. Now we are, we're singing the song because we figured it out. So thank <laughs> well, you very much. Well, it's a good tune. I appreciate that. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Jim. We'll be talking soon. Thanks to everybody. Um, thanks for tuning in. and. In the meantime, uh, we'll see you next week. In the meantime, keep listening beyond the sound bites.